looking back to the church's history, looking back and finding those folks who are advocating for uh, greater freedom in the world and uh, greater freedom of thought, and seeing that as fundamentally part and parcel of the church's mission in the world. The Acton Institute is named in honor of John Emmerich Edward Dahlberg Acton, the first Baron Acton of Aldenham and the historian of freedom. Known as, quote, the magistrate of history, Lord Acton was one of the great personalities of the 19th century. Widely considered one of the most learned Englishmen of his time, Lord Acton made the history of liberty his life's work. The most notable conclusion of Acton's work is that political liberty is the essential condition and guardian of religious liberty. He thereby points to the union of faith and liberty, which has been the inspiration for the mission of the Acton Institute. In describing the Acton Institute's purpose, President Emeritus Father Robert Sirico has said, quote, Acton realized that economic freedom is essential to creating an environment in which religious freedom can flourish. But he also knew that the market can function only when people behave morally. So faith and freedom must go hand in hand. As he put it, liberty is the condition which makes it easy for conscience to govern. So who really was Lord Acton? In this episode, I sit down with Dan Huger, Acton's librarian, a research associate, and editor of the book, Lord Acton, Historical and Moral Essays, to discuss Acton, his works, his beliefs, his life, and his legacy. Dan Huger is librarian and research associate at the Acton Institute. He writes and speaks on questions of education, history, political economy, and religion, and is the editor of two books, The Humane Economist, a Wilhelm Rupke Reader, and Lord Acton, Historical and Moral Essays. Today, we'll be discussing the life of Lord Acton. Dan Huger, welcome to Acton Line. Thanks for having me, Eric. Who was Lord Acton? Lord Acton is many things throughout his life. Lord Acton is, in his early life, a parliamentarian. Lord Acton is also uh, primarily a historian throughout his life. That's his academic training. Um, that's what uh, he spends his days doing. Um, Gertrude Himmelfarb writes about how in her biography of Lord Acton, uh, Lord Acton is studying conscience and politics, how he's sort of, you know, widely regarded by people in his social circles in Victorian England as sort of like the, the most widely read, knowledgeable man there is. Um, he made an extensive sort of life study of history. At the same time, he doesn't do what historians today do, which is write a big book uh, or a series of big books. So he is also a journalist and uh, he edits uh, several periodicals over the course of his life, writes book reviews, he writes um, – uh, all sorts of original historical essays. He writes on historical methodology and historical method. And uh, then he's also um, a Roman Catholic and he's an English Catholic, which is a very particular sort of precarious place to be uh, in the 19th century. And he is involved in the debates in the church at the time, particularly uh, uh, debates about the temporal power of the Pope, and he is involved in all sorts of doctrinal controversies, um, sort of on the edge. He comes from a very aristocratic family that has very, very deep roots in Europe. Uh, his mother's side of the family are the Dahlbergs. Uh, many of Europe's great cathedrals have sculptures uh, that were commissioned by the Dahlbergs. Um, so he's, he's both aristocratic He's cosmopolitan. Um, he is a man of the world, but is deeply sort of historically rooted as a very ancient uh, Catholic family. And he ends up spending uh, most of his life leveraging those things. He has connections. He has a stepfather who's a parliamentarian. He becomes intimate friends with uh, – 
Prime Minister Gladstone. Um, so he ends up having sway in both the church and in politics. And uh, but his enduring legacy is his work as a historian. What is his approach to his work as a historian? Because you mentioned that he wrote about uh, the theory of that and how to you know, there are plenty of theories of how historians are do or are supposed to approach studying history and communicating history. What, what was Acton's approach to that? So Lord Acton early in his life is very ambitious and he considers like several grand sort of historical projects uh, before he settles on his sort of lifelong project of a, a sort of universal history of liberty. He talks about in correspondence, you know, maybe doing uh, a history of the trial of Galileo, maybe the history of the modern popes, uh, examining the origins of the American constitution or uh, looking at the history of the Index of Forbidden Books. But what he settles on is the notion that he should really be and what the historian should really be is a, is a historian of ideas. And he talks about how the sort of institutional approaches in his early life, he talks about how, the, quote, the history of institutions is often a history of deception and illusions, for their virtue depends on the ideas that produce and on the spirit that preserves them. And the form may remain unaltered while the substance has passed away. So what he wants to do rather than study the things themselves is to study the ideas behind them, to get into the spirit of things and to look deeply and try to trace those ideas, in his case, particularly the history of liberty, um, that sort of for, that are formative of the human experience. And when you're looking at those ideas, that can take you in all sorts of directions in all areas of world history. Uh, his great teacher, Ignaz von Dullinger, talked about how the history of freedom shouldn't be so much, you know, the institutional history, but a sort of uh, uh, method that um, if you look at that the history of liberty is really also about a theory of history. And so part of the project is turning our attention to those great ideas and in particularly, again, he, he narrowed that focus, although it's, it's a very comprehensive focus, on the history of liberty itself. Would he have uh, accepted you – know, you hear you say this uh, you know, theory of uh, looking at history is like the history of great ideas. Would he have rejected the you – know, I think one of the other common approaches we hear of the great man of history theory? Um, is he really only looking at the ideas these people held or does he hold out the belief as well that there are just those individual people that influence and change the course of events and thus change history? So the people are important for Acton, and it's particularly important for the historian to examine the character of people. He talks about how, you know, great men are almost always bad men. So the historian is sort of an, you know, an archaeologist of ideas on the one hand, but he is also acts as a judge of those institutions and those people that articulate those ideas. Um, he is very concerned, you know, there's a sense in which, you know, we all face the final judgment in which we uh, are accountable for God for our actions here on earth. But there's also the, the, that the earthly task of judgment is the historian's task. Now, this sets ha Acton very much at odds with contemporary historical scholarship. A lot of historians today will try to be value neutral. They'll try they'll, – they'll think of that as a criterion of – you know, one of the things that makes history scientific is the idea that we're just explaining why people did these things. We're providing the context. But Acton was – you know, he had a saying that he liked to rely on where he talked about, you know, we have to be careful that too much explaining leads to too much excusing. And he thought that the historian would be remiss if the historian himself didn't bring his judgment to bear on his subjects and particularly people and institutions and how they live up to or fail to live up to those ideas that they articulate. 
This is probably a good place as any to bring up the, that if people are familiar with Lord Acton, perhaps, you know, the, the one of two ways they might be is from the Acton Institute. But generally speaking, if people are familiar with Lord Acton, it's for one single quote. And that quote is, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Can you give us the background of that quote and what Acton meant by that? So... That quote comes from Acton's correspondence, and in Acton's correspondence, you really get Acton uncut. Um, that particular passage comes from a letter to an exchange with Bishop Creighton. He also had a, uh, a lifelong correspondence with Mary Gladstone, uh, Prime Minister Gladstone's daughter, and several other figures in history. And at that time, he is trying to unpack some of his unease with – what would eventually be pro- what would be promulgated at the doctrine that would be promulgated at Vatican I about uh, the infallibility of the Pope. So he is looking at this, and this, of course, has political applications too. But Acton is wary of any sort of power that may be arbitrary, and that um, and that, that that corrosive nature of power. And he was very keen that that sort of arbitrary power not be exercised in the political realm, of course, which is mostly when people talk about this quote, they're talking about it in in, in terms of worldly politics. But he's also concerned about potential spiritual abuses of power. Now, Lord Acton in the First Vatican Council was a very, very long story. Um, And there are, uh, you know, this was an open question in the church. And he is, in fact, involved in the First Vatican Council, coordinating with various bishops who are also uneasy with this notion of papal infallibility and coordinating with them. That being said, I think, you know, in my private judgment, um, the fears of Lord Acton uh, have largely failed to materialize. There were folks at the time who thought, you know, the take home from papal infallibility would be that every morning they could read the Pope's opinions on any given question and apply them uh, to their lives. And the reality of it is, is the Popes have in the years since Lord Acton exercised that authority very, very sparingly and mostly on questions in which there's a great consensus in the church at the time they exercise it. Almost sounding like in the sense that uh, a lot of pronouncements from the U.S. Supreme Court are you know, less the formation of a position on it as it is just a coalescing around uh, a consensus that had already been arrived at. Yeah, exactly. So the – I've heard this interpretation from uh, – Jonah Goldberg brings it up on his podcast occasionally of that – the famous power uh, tends to corrupt quote from Acton. Um, and I want to run that interpretation by you to see if you think it's reflected in in those dialogues and correspondence he had with Bishop Creighton that it is possible to interpret that quote on its face. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely as being about those who hold and wield power. Uh, the piece of it, the, the interpretive part of it <clears throat> that uh, Goldberg offers is that in the context of the correspondence – Certainly Acton believed that about people who wield power, but he's more talking about how people are influenced by being around power and the things that they are willing to do or the things that they're willing to excuse of powerful people that they would never excuse of their child or of their neighbor or of their friend. I think I think I think that's an excellent way to look at it because those those corrosive aspects you know, we talked about Acton's fear of, of, of the exercise of arbitrary power, but there is a sense in which power is seductive as well, and that other people uh, act as you know enablers. Often, they become even those who don't exercise it somehow become captivated by it, and the way that that works itself out is it enables even more of that arbitrary exercise. So I think I think I think that's fair. I think that's 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 one of the constellations of concerns that Acton has, certainly. Talk a little bit more about uh his work with regard to 
the the Catholic Church. You talk some about the his concerns about the uh, temporal power of the Pope. You also <clears throat> mentioned his involvement in different doctrinal controversies. Uh, just explain a little bit more about what he was involved in, what he was concerned about, what those controversies were, and where Acton landed on them. So one way to look at this is to go back to Acton's personal connections um, to where this is rooted. Early on in his education, he goes to France to study uh, with uh, uh, Monsignor Doppelnoop, uh, who has a sort of experimental school. And he is uh, – Doppelnoop is a figure that uh, is somebody who argued for um, greater, uh, uh, greater liberty in society and believed that uh, – that is fundamentally not at odds with uh, with Catholicism. And this was very much an open question in the 19th century, is how does the church react to, um, you know, these new sort of ideas about political freedom, about religious freedom, these sorts of things. And so he is connected very early on in life with uh, major figures in France that are advocates of this, that don't see an incompatibility between faith and liberty, that don't see an incompatibility between faith and science. Now, when he goes to study uh, at university, he studies uh, with Ignaz von Dollinger, who I mentioned earlier, who is sort of the foremost Catholic historian in Europe at the time. And he teaches at the University of Munich. And Munich is sort of the center of intellectual Catholicism in Europe. Um, Dollinger himself is involved in sort of the revolution in historiographical methods of actually like going to archives. When Acton is very young, he actually goes to uh, the Vatican archives with Dollinger to assist him in his research. And to sort of like look at these documents to actually not just regurgitate the tales that have been told forever, but to actually critically examine those and go back to the sources. And this is part of a revolution in science that's going on throughout the European continent, and it's happening mostly in Protestant universities at the time. Munich is sort of an exception. Um, and so he is very much involved in trying to reconcile faith and reason in the context of the historical sort of discipline. And when you look at um, there's a great examination of this, for instance, in uh, – there is a book called uh, The Pope and, Professor, and the Professor by Thomas Albert Howard, which is about uh, sort of a dual biography of Pope Pius IX, who's the pope for much of Acton's life, and Ignaz von Dollinger. And they come to a head – uh, at, at Vatican I over the uh, papal infallibility. Dollinger is in fact excommunicated ultimately. And uh, Dollinger, uh, there is uh, as part – there is a, a small schism in the church after this with uh, what's called old Catholics and old Catholics still exist today in small communities. And uh, Dullinger knew many of the people involved in this. Uh, at the same time, Dullinger, uh did not take up many offers uh, at the time to lead this movement. He did not want to lead a schism in the church. He thought what he had was a principled disagreement, but that the, that 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 disagreement did not uh, entail any sort of obligation to be a schismatic or lead to further fracturing of the church. So that's that's one issue. It's that issue of infallibility. Another issue is the issue of the temporal power. And to unpack this for people, after uh, – through much of European history, the pope exercises temporal power over much of central Italy. And what this means is that he is not only the spiritual head of the church, he is also um, you know, the de facto ruler of these lands. Uh, the Pope is not unique in this respect uh, for much of European history because there are often bishops in various dioceses that are also temporal rulers. Acton saw that as a potential 
uh, saw in that the potential for a compromise of the church's spiritual witness. Um, and he thought that entangling the political and the spiritual in such a direct way led to that, that sort of temptations for corruption. And he also thought it led to compromises, as it did, with worldly powers. And we see this – so we often talk about – when we talk about Acton and the First Vatican Council, we talk about infallibility. But one of the other teachings of the First Vatican Council was the universal jurisdiction of the pope. Before the First Vatican Council in many places in Europe, you had particular rulers in Europe – who would appoint bishops and not the pope. Now, if a bishop passes away, if a bishop retires, the pope names the replacement. That is pretty much the norm in the Catholic world after the First Vatican Council. But prior to the Vatican Council, some bishops were elected. Some bishops were appointed by temporal rulers. You had temporal rulers that would often decide – on questions of uh, seminary formation, would decide how priests were trained in their particular uh, temporal dom domains. You would also have uh, questions of uh, whether or not certain papal bulls or documents were – or teachings were promulgated within those domains. And Acton saw that as a corruption from sort of the other end, that the church should govern itself, should have authority over its own teachings and should not cede that authority to temporal rulers. Um, so that's, that's sort of the other end of this controversy is, uh, you know, Abraham Kuyper talked about how one of the things that he wanted in the Netherlands was a free church – in a free state. And I think there's something analogous, although not, not quite the same because there's a, there's a Protestant perspective and there's unique dimensions to that with Kuiper, but that he wanted the church to have, you know, uh, true spiritual authority and for that spiritual authority to be universal as the church is indeed itself universal. While at the same time, he saw the danger from the opposite end with the temporal power of the papacy um, in, in his own day. As you were describing that the, the potential of compromises with worldly powers, uh, it made me think of the controversy that currently surrounds the uh, agreement, the details of which are not known, that the Vatican has with China. Yes. It makes me wonder how uh, Acton would have viewed you know, this current development of the Vatican trying to compromise, compromise with a worldly power that is very much not interested in uh, – the church itself. So, in one of the, in one of the things that I was I was I was preparing for this interview, I knew these sorts of questions would come up. So, the first disclaimer is that I will not answer for this great man. However, I will now answer for this great man and say that everything we know about Acton, these sorts of arrangements would have troubled him for all of the reasons that they trouble us today. Uh, the notion that the agreement is secret makes it very hard to be critical because we don't know exactly what compromises were made. We know, however, that this involves, uh, you know, granting some sway or influence to temporal rulers in, if not the election of bishops themselves, at least input in what sort of groups are being chosen from uh, to be elected. Uh, and again, the, the agreement is, is secret. It's hard to know. But this is precisely the sort of entanglement that Acton feared. And this is something that, you know, is sadly, um, you know, it's, it's, it's unique in a lot of ways to China today, but in the history of the church is not so. And, and many of these sorts of entanglements have existed. And, uh, he, and he believed that those sorts of entanglements compromise the church's spiritual witness. Would he have had any sympathy for the view of you know, the church is this institution that has continued to exist for thousands of years and one of the 
uh, one of the ways it has been able to do that, given there there are forces from outside of the church that are going to be brought to bear on the church itself. So I, I guess the the counter argument on just this specific China scenario would be, isn't the choice that the Vatican has between um, you know finding a way to work with a uh, a worldly power that is not going away anytime soon in order to have some sort of spiritual leadership and shepherding of the church in China or to not have that at all. Uh, and as such, it is a compromise and it presents its problems. But you know, all the hard decisions in life are between two good things or two bad things because the decision between a good and a bad thing isn't a decision at all. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, he would certainly appreciate the delicate nature of the situation. And these are things that have real consequences to believers in China, regardless. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and I am certain that any agreement had those things in mind. However, one of the unique things about Christianity as a religion that Acton posited was that it introduced – a sort of new conception of church and state to the world in a very bold and striking way. So he writes, and in, in if, if anybody would like to read anything by Lord Acton himself, I think the absolute best place to start is a lecture he gave called The History of Freedom in Antiquity. And from this, he draws out sort of in a very rough sketch the history of freedom from, you know, the beginnings of human civilization, from the Greeks, the Romans, the ancient Hebrews, and then goes forward basically to Christ himself. And uh, he writes there, he says that the Stoics could only advise wise men to hold aloof from politics, keeping the, keeping the unwritten law in his heart. But when Christ said, render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's, those words spoken on his last visit to the temple three days before his death gave the civil power under the protection of conscience a sacredness that it had never enjoyed and bounds it has never acknowledged. And they were the repudiation of absolutism and the inauguration of freedom. And the churches – that is part of the church's proclamation. That is part of – he Acton refers to, to uh, the church uh, later on in that essay as, as the most energetic institution in spreading this notion. Now, the particular question – the particular potential questions of, OK, what do you do when you have absolutely recalcitrant, unbelieving rulers – um, you know, those are difficult questions. I think Acton would be very, very wary of ever compromising that witness because he thinks that's essential. That's this is an essential point, not just to the integrity of the church, but to the church's own spiritual mission in 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 in, in the explicit teachings of Christ Himself that He gave to us all. So we've talked about his work as a historian. Can you talk about his uh, – you mentioned he was a parliamentarian. Talk about his politics, his influence on uh, the political issues of his time. So Acton was a very reluctant parliamentarian. He, as a young man, uh, is sort of impressed upon by his stepfather, Lord Granville – who was very involved in liberal party politics. Uh, the liberal party in England uh, was sort of one of the two major dominant parties along with the Tory party at the time. And the liberal party is, in, de is, is dedicated to principles of, of, of free trade, of you know, free markets as we might understand them. They were also – uh, very committed to religious liberty, particularly to folks uh, in communities that uh, were not uh, parts of the Church of England. This involves various Protestant dissenters as well as as, as well as Roman Catholics, and they are uh, particularly uh, uh, interested in questions regarding uh, rule of Ireland. Um, they tend to have a more lenient policy towards the Irish than uh, the Tory party. And Acton is in fact put up uh, – when Lord Granville writing in uh, uh, 
1857, uh, writes, uh, quote, I am trying to get Johnny Acton in for some place in Ireland. I am glad to find that although he is only a moderate Whig, he is also a very moderate Catholic. Um, he ends up winning, uh, representing the Irish borough of Carlow from uh, 1859 to 1865. And he almost immediately finds out that this is not well suited for the, you know, the, the sort of person who's a scholar is not the sort of person that's suited for parliament. And he talks about, you know, very early on, uh, he says, quote, if I could only get turned out of parliament in an honest way and settle down among my books. Now, that being said, he does take uh, a keen interest in sort of bread and butter issues um, in Ireland. So he is looking uh, into question of tenant rights. He's active uh, working for that. He's active in uh, issues of religious freedom for Catholics. Um, in fact, in his borough, like the only campaigning he does is he lo- writes the local priest and introduces himself. And he's, you know, I'm I'm Catholic and I'm running <laughs> uh, for the Liberal Party in the constituency. Uh, you know, any help you could give would be great. Um, but it's it's largely those sort of bread and butter political issues, and he doesn't engage in any sort of great controversies in Parliament, and he doesn't ascend to any sort of leadership within Parliament. His stepfather very much wanted him to. Uh, took him. Uh, he he uh, was in, uh, went to the coronation of a czar in Russia, leading up to this as part of a, 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 a delegation for the English government. There, he kind of plays the event planner, <laughs> you know, wrangling invitations, trying to get uh, English china and particularly English glassware there, so you know they can host a proper English. Reception. He also goes to America um, as part of this sort of tour with another relative uh, involved in politics. Um, so you know, while you know, you know, there's family pressure. Eventually, when he when he when he loses re-election in that constituency, he ends up running once more again uh, for a constituency in England and losing. And at that point, he's sort of off the hook and and free to pursue his uh, scholarly interests. You mentioned when you were discussing his work as a historian earlier that, uh, you know, unlike many modern historians, he didn't write uh, a, a great huge book or a series of great huge books on it. Was it's two parts to this question. Was that an active choice on his part or was it just kind of the way that it worked out given his his interests and his habits and his philosophy of history? And then secondly, what are the most prominent works from Acton that exist out there if there is – you mentioned um, one earlier, the, uh, the lecture. Uh, but what other key pieces would you point people towards? Acton is a very busy man throughout his life and he's involved in – politics. He's involved in controversies of the church. A lot of this takes away from – and he's involved in in his journalistic career as as an editor and as somebody, you know, being a regular contributor to a number of periodicals. So part of it is time. Part of it is the immense nature of the project. Um, His library is, uh, is now housed at Cambridge University and along with that library are notes, innumerable amounts of notes, um, half thought out ideas, themes, these sorts of things. There's a great collection put out by Liberty Fund that's probably the most comprehensive collection that somebody could come come about uh, readily available that's uh, uh, by Rufus Fears, uh, was the editor of that volume. And that volume contains a lot of his published work in periodicals, lectures, that sort of thing. But it also includes, I think, half of the third volume are uh, selections from those notes that Rufus Fears went through. And, they, and they're arranged topically and they're very interesting. But that's just, that's just a sample of what's there. Um, so part of it is just, you know, it's just a hugely ambitious project. Eventually, he gets a university appointment at Cambridge and he thinks and he realizes as he's, as he's, as he's getting older, uh, getting towards the end of his life, that he's not going to be able to write this. So he conceives of this project called the Cambridge Modern History and he thinks, OK, I might not be able to write it. 
But I can write part of it, and then I can commission historians that I know, that I think are experts in their fields, to write various sections of this. And this is a huge multi-volume effort. Uh, Lord Acton never finishes his contribution, which was to be sort of the introductory chapter on sort of the medieval background of the modern world. And uh, Bishop Creighton ends up, uh, his good friend, uh, taking over that project after he passes because he, he, he passes away uh, uh, shortly before the, the first volume of that comes out. Um, so there was, there was an attempt to wrangle that. Now, what we have, though, is a treasure trove. So I edited a volume uh, called uh, Lord Acton uh, Historical and Moral Essays that includes – that I try to sort of reconstruct – you know, in a bare outline, what this history of liberty could have looked like. And it begins with that history of freedom and Christianity essay, which is a very broad, sweeping overview of the ancient world. Um, there's a follow-up lecture called The History of Freedom and Christianity, which then sort of takes up where that leaves off. Um, he also writes a very long uh, book review of Sir Erskine May's Democracy in Europe, which is also in that collection. And that takes us up to, uh, in, in, again, in very, very broad outlines, sort of, uh, you know, uh, Acton's, Acton's own time. And he writes uh, an essay called Nationality that covers some of the same uh, periods in which actually has some w wonderfully interesting things to say about Lord Acton's sort of take on on the concept of nationality and sort of the nationalism of the uh, 19th century. Um, then there's – if you're talking about method and the method is both – we talked about you know, trying to make history more scientific in terms of return to sources, that sort of thing. But also this question of the historian's sort of ethical role as a moralist and as a judge, uh, his inaugural lecture that he gave uh, at Cambridge uh, when he uh, became the uh, Regis Professor of Modern History there is also great. Now, those would be the, how I constructed this collection. Those are literally like the first the first one, two, three, four, five in there. I am aware that reading is hard and that trudging through things are hard. So what I endeavored to do is, you know, front load that with all of what I think is the most essential stuff and to do some sort of continuity. Now, there's, there's some other things in there, the beginning of the modern state. There's stuff on uh, – is there uh, – there's stuff on the American Revolution that he wrote and other things like that. And I try to basically reconstruct this in broad outlines from antiquity to the American Revolution uh, to kind of give people at least an idea of, 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 of where the various threads he was going after were tracking in that. And I'd, I'd, I'd recommend that volume for um, if somebody wanted to read into Acton himself. Now, that being said, with this project never complete, um, maybe the best introduction to Lord Acton's thought is in fact not anything he wrote, but uh, a great biography written by Gertrude Himmelfarb that Acton also publishes called Lord Acton, A Study in Conscience and Politics. And this gives you some of the great biographical flavor, but it also gives you a very robust articulation of Acton's ideas, particularly touching on the nature of liberty. So if, if one wants, you know, Acton in under 300 pages, um, you know, by a very gifted writer and under – oh, I'm looking at the volume now – so we can, you know, that's acting in 219 pages, both biography, leading ideas, themes. Uh, she's a brilliant writer. Um, I had actually written her uh, when I was assembling my collection uh, for an endorsement and, and, and to write an introduction. Um, she was uh, – uh, uh, she was nearing the end of her life at that point. I didn't know that at the time, but was still very active in correspondence and wrote very kind note and basically gave me the greatest compliment I've ever received, which is I can't imagine adding anything to your already fine introduction. Now, that might have been the very gracious way that she was inclined to blow me off, uh, but it was still – it's still something I keep to this day. How was Acton viewed in his time? So Acton is viewed differently 
by different folks at his time. You have, again, there are, you know, controversies raging in the Catholic Church in England and all over Europe about sort of the nature of the church in the modern world, relation of faith and science. He has his opponents there, Cardinal Manning among them. Uh, he, uh, there's another publication. He edited a publication called The Rambler. If you want a good, uh, a good sort of overview of the range of Catholic opinion in England, The Rambler would be maybe on one poll. Uh, Lord Acton wrote for The Rambler. Uh, St. John Henry Newman wrote for The Rambler. Um, there were uh, other folks uh, involved uh, in The Rambler. But then there was also the Dublin Review. And the Dublin Review was highly critical of the Rambler, highly critical of Acton's entire project um, of that reconciling of faith and science and uh, faith and freedom. And so you have you have that. Uh, Acton is uh, – so in the Protestant world of England now, Acton is looked at – is well regarded. Um, he is viewed as, you know, and part of this is the history of Catholicism in England. Um, and this begins, you know, well, England has a troubled history with Catholicism. It was only shortly before Lord Acton's uh, birth that uh, Catholics were granted the right to vote in England after many, many years of uh, – of, of being sort of shut out of the political process. Uh, in 1570, Pope Pius V excommunicates uh, Queen Elizabeth I, whom he referred to as the pretended queen of England and the servant of crime. Um, and basically wrote, you know, you know, that Catholics in England should not recognize. Um, there is, you know, the gunpowder plot. There's all sorts of intrigue in England. Um, and there is sincere, sustained oppression of Catholics in England uh, that comes out of this. So a lot of a lot of folks, particularly in England, particularly after the First Vatican Council and the Declaration of Papal Infallibility, uh, Prime Minister Gladstone is immensely troubled by this and and writes and writes a piece about, you know, maybe, maybe, Maybe Catholics, maybe maybe the the historic English hostility to Catholicism wasn't entirely unwarranted, and Acton actually writes in defense of English Catholics uh, in response to this, and says that you know no you know Catholics uh, can be both uh, loyal uh, subjects in England and you know truly Catholic. Um, so you have a, a better Protestant reception in England. You also have. Uh, a better reception of Acton in Germany as a historian because part of, uh, you know, the center of this modern sort of reinvigorating of the discipline is, is in Germany and in other continental universities. England runs a little behind. America runs even a little further behind on that revolution. Um, those sort of back to the sources archival work you know, becomes the gold standard in history. Um, and Acton is remembered as a figure that, you know, made contributions there. And uh, there is uh, still extensive German appreciation of Lord Acton. Lord Acton also, you know, spoke and wrote in German fluently, um, wrote some things in German. Um, so he's, he's well received there. That all of that being said, I remember I, I went to Hillsdale College, which is a place that is, you know, very consonant with a lot of the things we do at the Acton Institute. I never read anything from Lord Acton at Hillsdale College. I, in fact, when I was when I was working on my my edited volume of Lord Acton, I reached out to Brad Berzer, one of my history professors, who was very gracious in writing a foreword for that book. So there's interest in Acton, but he's not, you know, he's not a figure that at least in the English speaking world today is that widely recognized. And a lot of times the first time people hear about Lord Acton is through the, the Acton Institute. Um, when I first took a position with Acton, I, I called up my father and I said, hey, I got this job offer with the Acton Institute. And he says, oh, do they work with Broadway Grand Rapids? 
because he thought I, I said the Acting Institute. And he's like, he's like, well, what's acting? So, you know, you know he's a he's a university educated professional man, uh, but, you know, was was totally ignorant um, of Lord Acton, the historian. So somebody – I mean this is part of, you know, the institute – you know, this is a subject that's very dear to me because it's in a way about me because this is how I've spent my professional life. And uh, I think he's someone that is that is underappreciated today and underread. And he is a brilliant writer. He has great turns of phrase, and I think he has a lot to say to the modern world, both in terms of being sort of, you know, someone who believed in, you know, the fundamental compatibility of faith and science, of faith and freedom, but also as somebody who saw it as incumbent upon people, even in academic work, to bring a moral dimension to that and to let that inform the conversation. So I think, I think you know, he's, he's underappreciated, um, but, uh, but uh, I think, I think, I think all, I think there's, there's, there's so much there that uh, people can learn from. And I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the more available and wide known we can make him, the, the better. What was it that personally piqued your interest in Acton? So when I started at the Acton Institute, I thought I should really know something about Lord Acton. Uh, I was working in a more administrative capacity at that point. But I would talk to people and people would ask this question. And you, you, know, you always give the, oh, he's a 19th century historian sort of thing. And um, I started digging and uh, there's another moment that, that, that sort of accelerated my interest. Uh, actually, two other moments. The first was uh, reading uh, Hayek's uh, Individualism, True and False. One of the people who appreciated Acton keenly was the economist uh, F.A. Hayek. And he saw Acton as representing a true and authentic, organic liberalism as opposed to a rationalistic, reductionistic, atheistic liberalism. And he held out people like Lord Acton and like Edmund Burke and Adam Smith as people who uh, are committed to freedom but also have a robust understanding of the human person that isn't reductionistic, that isn't rationalistic that isn't, you know, in his terms, scientistic. So that that was the second peaking of my interest. The other was in looking at the history of what we call, you know, sort of the liberty movement, the Mount Pelerin Society, early meetings, there was discussion about what to name the group. They were meeting at Mount Pelerin, but they hadn't decided on a name. And I think I'm remembering this correct. But at some point, uh, the idea of the Acton Tocqueville Society was put forward as two sort of outstanding figures of this true, uh, you know, you know, authentic representation of the liberal tradition, and also, um, you know, folks that you know emb- embody sort of individualism rightly understood, you know, embedded in a community context, embedded in history, and I believe it was Frank Knight who was not keen on the idea of naming the society after two Roman Catholics. Um, so they, it was eventually resolved that they would just name the society after where they were meeting. So this is, this is somebody who loomed large. If you look at, you know, Henry Hazlitt, very famous for economics in one lesson, also wrote a fascinating volume called The Freeman's Library. And that volume is basically a large annotated bibliography of what Hazlitt thought up to that point was the very finest written on the issues of freedom. And it's, you know, hundreds if not thousands of books um, listed. And in the introduction, he says that, you know, I realize most people, like this is a very intimidating list. So here's my top 10. And he included an anthology of Lord Acton's works in that top 10. And that was another thing that sort of piqued my interest. In your opinion, and and let's sum this up for everyone listening, what is Lord Acton's legacy? His legacy is bringing the church into constructive dialogue with the modern world, um, ta- of, of, of examining the sort of history, you know, um, 
you know, what Adam Smith called the system of natural liberty, of taking a look at issues like freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom uh, of speech, of the sort of free economy, looking at those developments in the modern world and seeing and, and, and showing those in the church that are skeptical that there is a liberty before liberalism, that what a com- you know, commitment to freedom entails isn't necessarily the anthropology of John Stuart Mill. That uh, there's a great uh, observation he makes where he talks about all of these ideas can be found in the ponderous Latin of Jesuits who were subjects of the Spanish crown of Lesius, Molina, Mariana, and Suarez. And he makes that case at a very difficult time, at a very politically charged time for, for Catholics around the world. I mean, there are a series of revolutions in 1848. There's a lot of anti-clericalism paired with some of these revolutions. And Acton draws our attention to the fact that these ideas can be synthesized, that there can be an authentic Catholicism that is committed to human freedom, that is com- committed to uh, to science in the sort of jo- robust sort of German Wissenschaft sense, and that uh, these things are not there's 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 no need for these things to be antagonistically perceived, and I think you see a lot in uh, the Second Vatican Council that reflects this sort of understanding and appreciation. Uh, you think of Dignitas Humanae on religious liberty. You think of, you know, the, you know all, all, all the, you know, uh, you know, God Amen Spies. Like, you see, you know, not necessarily the recapitulation of certain arguments always, but you see a way that the church is, 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 is thinking, you know, we have to have a constructive relationship with the modern world and we have something you know vital to contribute to that um we are not you know antagonists of that you know we have um you know there are certain things where the world needs the church's spiritual witness and all of these things are enriched by it but they're not in opposition fundamentally. That that fundamentally, you know, I think of scholasticism as the great project is, is, is reconciling authorities of looking back to the church's history, looking back and finding those folks who are advocating for uh, greater freedom in the world and uh, greater freedom of thought and seeing that as fundamentally part and parcel of the church's mission in the world and part of its social witness. And I think, I think that's been an, a, a, a tremendous contribution um, at a time in which those sorts of conversations were very, very difficult. I think he did them, he defended them in a very forthright way, in a way that uh, is inspiring to us today. Dan Huger is librarian and research associate at the Acton Institute. He writes and speaks on questions of education, history, political economy, and religion. He is the editor of two books, The Humane Economist, a Wilhelm Rucke Reader, and Lord Acton, Historical and Moral Essays. Dan, thanks so much for joining us today on Acton Line. Thanks for having me. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Combs.